Madam Chair, Chairman, uh, Lady, I, per, I move that HR, HCR 2003 be returned with a due pass recommendation. Oh, thank, thank you. Go ahead. Madam Chair, members, House Concurrent Resolution 2003 calls for an Article 5 convention to propose amendments to the United States Constitution, which will impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limit the terms of office for officials and members of Congress. With that, I'm available for questions. Members, are there any questions? Thank you. Okay, well, this is my bill, and so I'm going to give a brief um, explanation, and then I'm going to turn it over. Uh, the Vice Chair will call the uh, folks that are signed in to speak to have their say. Um, this is a, the second time that this bill has come through. It has a minor adjustments from last year's bill so that it can um, be exact with the other bills that are out there going on in the country right now so that they'll be word for word. Uh, this has generated quite a few emails to you, I am sure. And there is quite a lot of interest from around the country in Arizona's participation in requesting that the um, federal government call an Article 5 convention specifically to propose a specific amendment uh, to the United States Constitution. Uh, again, <coughs> this I, I'm wanting to hold my comments, I think, until we hear from, from the speakers. But I, I would like to say that it's important to remember, members, that as this convention happens, whatever the result is of that convention, it will require 38 states to ratify uh, that amendment that is put out by, by this convention. So having gone to the Mount Vernon Assembly, which was legislators from around the country interested, in, including Democrat members from around the country, interested in um, using this part of the Constitution to uh, approach the federal government and rein in uh, the abuses that we're seeing. We have been interested in this. It's, if nothing else, as legislators in the country, without outside influential groups, have come together on our own dime, a meeting to discuss the issues that we face as states, as sovereign states. And so that has been a wonderful experience for myself. And the more I participate in that, that experience, the more convinced I am that this does need to happen. It has generated some concerns for me, but those concerns, again, um, are relieved when I remember that 38 states do have to ratify the amendments that are specific to the call. So this particular bill, and I know that it, there might be some confusion among members, but remember here in Arizona, we have three different approaches to request that the federal government call a convention of states and this is one of them one of the three we heard uh, a speaker on our first committee meeting um, mr. Michael Ferris came in and explained this particular bill to us so this is convention of states approach uh, to calling this article 5 convention so with that uh, and my support I'm going to ask the vice chair to bring up our first speaker Our first speaker, speaking for herself, will be uh, former Representative uh, Barbara Bluster. She's speaking for the bill. Speaking I'm sorry, against the bill. Um, Thank you, Madam Chairman and members. I want to tell you that this is the 32nd year I have worked on stopping constitutional convention calls. That is a long time but and I want to tell you that the first 20 well in 2003 the Arizona legislature by about a total of all but one member house both Republicans and Democrats voted to rescind all of Arizona's past calls for a constitutional convention call it was a lot of work to get that done the calls were always hookers for conservatives get prayer back in school, st reverse Roe versus Wade, um, uh, flag burning, uh, constitutional conventions for those things. 
where we rescinded all of those, not because we were against those things, but because a convention is a very, very dangerous thing. And when Representative Townsend says that 38 states ratified, uh, would have to ratify, believe me, 38 states did ratify the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, up to the 26th Amendment. Most of them have been terrible for our country. But the propaganda machine goes on, and it's worthwhile studying word control, mind control. You don't, you, we're, you're, it's in a frenzy. You get in a frenzy of panic. And this panic of our budget has been purposely created and created for a long time. But I want to back up and refer to this bill, line 21, I think about. A call, a call Congress to con call a convention of the states limited to proposing amendments to the Constitution of the United States that impose fiscal restraints on the federal government. What do you think Article One, Section 8 does? How are you going to restrict the federal government any more than that? So let me remind you, the federal government is authorized to have post offices, a few roads, a patent office, some courts. They can run a war and diplomatic, uh, the diplomacy um, embassies, immigration. They can have a mint. They can repel invasion, and they can train militias, the federal government. That's all they're allowed to do now. How are you going to restrict it more than it's restricted? And you know how? It's up to you, each state, to say no to federal funds. You are ready for the handouts, and I'm not saying you personally. I'm talking about our whole country is drunk on federal funds. Drunk. And until we have the spine to say no, we're going to have more and more debt. We live on debt at 17 trillion, 18 trillion, or whatever it is. We're using debts as assets. And do you think any other amendment is going to make Congress abide the Constitution? No. I want to review for you all just quickly. Well, I have too many things to go through here. <clears throat> I want to say, here's what um, some of the Supreme Court briefs have said. Former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Warren Burger said, once you call a convention, you cannot control it. It's a sovereign entity. So Warren Burger said, I have also repeatedly given my opinion that there is no effective way to limit or muzzle the actions of a constitutional convention. The convention could make its own rules and set its own agenda. Professor Gerald Gunther, Stanford University School of Law, a convention cannot be effectively limited. <laughs> Professor Neil Kogan, <clears throat> Southern Methodist University School of Law, neither the convention nor the states may limit the amendments. Charles Rice of uh, Notre Dame Law School, instead of enchanting the dangers of a constitutional convention, turn the spenders out of office. That's an easy way, and you, well, I'll address that in a minute. Professor Bork, U.S. Court of Appeals Chief Justice, the power of a simple majority of Congress to call a convention to propose a single amendment on a specific topic. Representative Blush, you have ten, 10 been, seconds. I ten, beg your pardon. I'm sorry, you have 10 seconds. Sorry. I have 10 seconds? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A lame duck session. The second part, oh gosh, can I have 10 more, can I have a minute more? No, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe there you can is, have another speaker. Okay, talk about there it. is a new constitution already written, I want you all to know. It's called the New States of America. Whatever the propaganda is ready, it's ready to go. Thank you. Thank you, and then you'll have more time to, to <clears throat> say something as you're answering questions, so. Okay. Madam so, Chair, could I ask? Uh, uh, oh, one second. Um, I wanted to speak to, to that point, uh, okay. three items, and then we'll I'll go ahead and let you ask her. Okay. I agree with you emphatically, Ms. Booster, about the issue with debt and accepting federal dollars. And that is, to me, one of my uh, very equivalent to this other HCR 2003, a must in, in our state is 
and I always say when daddy pays the bills you have to go by his rules you know and and as we, we are having our bills paid by the federal government we have to go by their rules which may or may not be constitutional and so I think that is a very important step that we need to do as a state is to say basically austerity measures we have to cut back we have to stop accepting and I remember a former governor um, excited about a second stimulus and everyone in the room crying out no please we don't want any more federal money because that just means more strings attached so I absolutely agree with you on that front and I think we can all agree together and, and join forces on that and and uh, put pressure uh, here in Arizona to to find ways um, and we are looking at that there are some creative ways that we can start becoming self-sufficient as a state a little bit more uh, secondly um, I, to address your comment about they're not uh, obeying the Constitution now, they're not you know, going to recognize it now, why would another amendment make it any different? And I always answer that with I have teenagers and oftentimes they don't like to go by my what I ask them to do, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop. You know, If there's a new situation comes up, that not, I'm not going to say, well, you don't listen to me anyway, so I'm not going to enforce a new rule on this particular situation. I make that rule and then I press for enforcement and compliance on that rule and so we have to focus on compliance of the ones that are there already and we don't I would be a bad parent if I just gave up and said well you're not doing it now what what's what's the use um, you you had talked about the um, that, that they would make up their own rules so their their own sovereign entity and then they could come up and right now and I, I'm gonna ask representative Thorpe to speak to that but we are working as states and that's one of the things we're talking about very specifically when we go to the assembly of state legislatures the former Mount Vernon assembly is our delegate limitation acts and uh, how the states can then if we see them beginning to make up their own rules we can as states recall those delegates and then rem and then that uh, 34 threshold would would uh, be gone and they couldn't have their um, their conventions so as states that's what we're working on right now as we move forward is our delegate limitation acts to assuage those fears and um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to representative Wheeler who seemed to task first is very eager to ask you a question thank you thank you madam chair again representative Lewster it's good to see you you know we all agree here that no matter what our <coughs> excuse me differences of opinion that this system is a vigorous system for honest debate amongst people who respect each other and yet are at opposite poles so my good friend from Flagstaff is one example of a good friend and we certainly don't agree on too much but I do appreciate your comments because um, you know where this is an example where you and I on some issues are going to disagree yet on this one we are complete allies uh, perhaps for different reasons but that's what makes this a vigorous democracy and a good debate um, I look forward if this ever were to pass <coughs> um, to adding to the agenda equality of marriage I, uh, I don't know what anyone else's position would be on that equality for women universal health care and a host of other issues that I think this nation needs to address uh, and catch up with modern times instead of debating what happened in 1787 or 1932. <clears throat> I think it's time we debate what's happening right now. To your point of uh, Justice Berger, uh, also I want to add, as you well know, Justice Scalia is very opposed to this. Um, to this. He said that, uh, I certainly would not want a constitutional convention. Who knows what could be added to the agenda? So we can get into a debate of we're tied down by delegates, but you know, if California is one of those states that votes for a constitutional convention, I am sure that you're gonna have delegates that believe strongly in California, as in Arizona, and is, as in every other single state of this country, the equality of marriage for all our citizens, the freedom to marry whomever we love and want to spend our lives with. I can assure members that will be on the agenda if this is ever to become a constitutional uh, convention. Um, I'm not going to support this most likely, um, as, as you don't, perhaps for different reasons. But if it does, we're going to take advantage of modern times, modern thought, freedom, liberty, 
and the freedom to associate with whom we wish and the rights that are universal for all human beings in a constitution that catches up with the times. Thank and to that point, uh, Representative Wheeler, um, then if those are the kinds of amendments that you would like to have discussed at a constitutional or at a convention of states, I would tell you that what you would need to do is draft language for your own bill because you have to have issue specific um, <coughs> bill to Congress requesting this. So you could not go to that convention and, and propose those because those are not listed in this call. So you would have to call your own um, and pass it through the House and in the Senate and get it to Congress in order for those amendments to even be entertained. And so I think Representative Thorpe was next, and then after that we'll go with Representative Pynchon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mrs. Blooster, um, can you tell me where in the Constitution it has the words next to each other, Constitutional Convention? Well, Article 5 has always been referred to, always been referred to both in and, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, can, please, you, can, uh, you, let's can have you tell me where in the Constitution it has the words Constitutional Convention? That's my question to no. you. So in other words, it does not? It does not. Okay. If you, don't, if you don't mind for a moment, I'll read a portion of Article 5, because it's important to understand this. Yes, I, um, I think. Okay, Congress so before we, before we go on. We need to go through the chair, so I can't have you guys talking back and forth. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> don't, don't hesitate to remind me. Um, it talks about the Congress, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. I think it's really important. We're talking about proposing an amendment, just like Congress proposes amendment. Uh, if Congress gets together and they propose an amendment, the day after they're done proposing it, nothing has changed. If the state legislatures come together in convention and propose amendments, or, or one amendment, the day after, nothing has changed. I completely agree with you that the states haven't always ratified good amendments, uh, prohibition being one, but they went back and they fixed that problem. Here in the legislature, every day we come in here, we potentially can cause mistakes to state law. And every year when we come back, uh, we end up fixing those mistakes. We're certainly fallible uh, in, in, in uh, making our determinations. There were 14 conventions leading up to the Philadelphia Convention. None of them were runaway conventions. The, conven the Washington Convention of 1861 was called by Virginia. The purpose of that convention was to try to keep the Civil War from occurring. The convention lasted for two weeks. You can re I have a copy of the scanned notes, the day-by-day -day notes, the journal of that convention. If we were going to have a runaway convention where tempers flare and things got done that weren't on the agenda, don't you think it would have happened in 1861 when the North and the South were at each other's necks? It didn't happen. My Delegates Limitation Act uh, forces, if we can get that one passed, will force each member, each delegate that goes to the convention to take an oath to the legislature to uphold the subject of the convention. If they do anything that the legislature doesn't want them to do, uh, the legislature can immediately recall, replace, and nullify their vote. So that, that act, and we can also penalize them in civil court for, for defying the instructions of the legislature. That act will help protect uh, a convention. But I think the most important thing is throughout our Constitution, we have checks and balances. The, the, we have a very high hurdle of requiring uh, 34 states just to call a convention we have to then have 38 states ratify whatever comes out of that convention. And if we make a mistake, other legislatures or other Congresses can go back in and they can nullify that amendment. They can repeal that amendment. We, we have flexibility built into the system. George Mason argued in, the, in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention that this was a, a power that was absolutely needed by the people to check a runaway federal government, which is what we have. James Madison supported this. Ronald Reagan supported this. James Hamilton supported this. And the 
numerous times in the Federalist Papers. If you if you read, and I always forget his name. I think it's Dr. Lockett or Dr. Leggett, but basically James Madison wrote. Uh, to uh, one of the members of Congress um, who was asking the question of nullification. Should we use nullification? James Madison replied, uh, no, because it causes inconsistencies through, throughout the states. If one state decides to nullify a federal law and another state uh, does not, then you have an inconsistent system. So what James Madison told him was it was already in the Constitution, Article 5, the ability of the states to come together. Uh, if, if the federal government, like the Alien Sedition Act, gets passed by the, uh, the President of the United States, uh, James, uh, um, or, or John Adams, excuse me, that the states then, um, in that case, did use nullification, but James Madison argued that the, the way that you deal with an out-of-control federal government is to use Article 5. Okay, so uh, Representative Fincham. I just I want to be clear. You know, I've, I've, I see this often, and I, 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 words have meaning, and we have to be very cautious about the words that we use. As I read uh, Justice Scalia's comments and, and also uh, Justice Berger's comments, there's little context other than to say a constitutional convention. We are talking not about a constitutional convention of congressional members. We are talking about a convention of the states. So I would ask you, where does the power in this nation come from? Oh, it comes from it's Madam the Chairman. Chair. I'm sorry, Madam Chairman. Darn it, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair and Ms. Bluster. Um, Madam Chairman and Representative Meekham. Me Fincham. 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 Uh, what was your question again? Where does the power in this nation come from? It, it sounds like uh, I'm, I'm not being condescending. I just want to make a point. Well, it's supposed to come from the citizens. Thank you. However. Madam Chair. Please, Mr. I've, Finch. I've got my answer. It comes from the people. The people, in turn, have ceded a small amount of power to the legislatures to conduct their business. The legislatures, in turn, have ceded even smaller amount of power to the federal government. So when it comes to the alteration of our Constitution, that government which is closest to the people governs best for the people. And it is my belief that a convention of the states, certainly not Congress, is more appropriately fitted to working through amendments to our Constitution not some federal bureaucracy's constitution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Fincham. Okay, so in the interest of time, thank you, Ms. Bluster. Question, we, Madam Chair. Oh, my apologies. Thank Go you, ahead. Madam Chairman, um, <coughs> former Representative Bluster. I, I, we heard an example of, of a convention uh, from 1761. I was wondering if you might have any information on the 1787 Philadelphia Constitutional mm -hmm. Convention. Um, again, my understanding, brief understanding, is that at that convention, um, they ignored the charge of Congress and in essentially rewrote an entirely new constitution. Can you speak to that? Yes, Madam Chairman, Rep Representative Rios. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, the delegates from New York walked out because we were not following what the Articles of Confederation uh, the, what the delegates agreed to do under the Articles of Confederation. They walked out. New York did. <clears throat> so n they did change completely. And they even changed, if you'll remember, that they did not need uh, 13 states to approve it, but only nine states to approve the new Constitution. And s there is no guarantee that a new Constitutional Convention would allow, uh, would not change that requirement of 38 states. There's no guarantee that at all. And if I may add this, something well, or briefly, not. Very briefly, because we're starting to run out of time. Well, there's nothing wrong with our Constitution. It is our solution. It is what butters our bread. It keeps government out of our hair. And you're allowing, you're opening it up. You can't control it. 
Okay, and to that point, um, George Mason argued to include the states in the Article V process in giving them the ability to call a convention of states, or not to call it, but to petition Congress to call it, because he foresaw the situation we are in now, an out of control, runaway Congress. And so if you, know, you say the Constitution is just fine, well, that is in the Constitution, giving the states the ability to call a convention, uh, or to, excuse me, to petition for the convention. And so, yes, I agree with you. Our Constitution is um, our supreme law, and in it is this provision for us to do the same thing that Congress can do today. If, co if somebody wanted to uh, propose an amendment um, to the Constitution, to fill in the blank, let's say repeal this, the Second Amendment or to adjust the First Amendment or to put equal rights or, or whatever else, come up with your craziest, you know, runaway ideas that might get proposed in this convention of states that's so upsetting and completely wipe out the Constitution and start over. That can happen today in Congress. Congress can propose that crazy amendment that we're afraid of today. They have that ability to do that. So just because a state proposes it is no different from Congress proposing it. And if co why isn't Congress proposing it? Because they're not going to get 38 states to ratify a wild and crazy amendment. So even if it does go off the rails and you have all these different things coming through, that could happen today. And it's not happening today because we know that the, the it's uh, exercise in futility. And in the interest of time, I'm going to go to Representative Thorpe. And, and <coughs> Madam Chair, and to the points that were made, uh, there's no authority in our Constitution to have a constitutional convention. So, uh, you know, again, calling it, a, you know, words have meaning, and calling it a constitutional convention is so inaccurate, and I just don't appreciate even hearing that. It's a convention for proposing amendments. Earlier conventions were referred to as also federal conventions. They were the 14 conventions that occurred prior to the constitutional convention were called by various states to deal with national issues. Um, I do not, you know, because we've never had uh, a federal uh, convention or convention of the states have been, that's been a runaway, we're basically hypothesizing that it's going to be. Uh, we have a real runaway Congress. We do, we've never had a runaway convention of the states. Um, the, and the notion that our original Philadelphia convention was a runaway uh, is such a slap in the face. That's saying that, pre that the president of the convention, George Washington, violated congressional instructions that men like uh, James uh, uh, Madison, who is the architect of our Constitution, was in violation of Congress. Uh, all those noble people that met in Philadelphia and painstakingly built our Constitution were all in violation of Congress. What's, you know, and I'm, I'm far from a constitutional uh, scholar where I can uh, really name off all the reasons why that's wrong, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a common sense reason why it's wrong is because the convention was in constant communication with Congress. It was also, the members were in constant uh, communication with their legislatures, telling them what was happening at the convention, why they were going the direction they were going in. Congress never objected to that. It was determined very early in the uh, Philadelphia Convention that the Articles of, of uh, Confederation that would be extremely difficult uh, to salvage that, to modify the Articles of Confeder Confederation to enable a strong enough central government to do the things we needed it to do. And one of the biggest drivers was commerce, interstate commerce and, and trade with uh, foreign nations. Okay. Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Thorpe. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, will you please call the next member? And thank you, Ms. Blue. Yes, uh, the next speaker speaking for the bill will be Mr. Mike Capick, and he represents himself. Welcome, Mr. Capick. You have five minutes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee. For uh, many decades now, we've the American people, we've all been seeing a number of things uh, that have been changing. And we haven't been able to quite put our finger on it. But as we get closer and closer to this period that we have today, we're beginning to recognize that our government is not the same government that we had 
a hundred years ago. In fact, going back to 1913 in the Woodrow Wilson era, we began to, to develop a second constitution, one that, that began to, uh, through the uh, Supreme Court, began to uh, interpret, in, in some people's minds, misinterpret the, the rule of law, which is the Constitution of the United States. They, they began to uh, develop things uh, as in the uh, 16th Amendment, we got the, the uh, income tax, the 17th, the Senate was taken away from you and, and us and given to the, to, back to us, which has actually lost our state's rights through that, um, through that amendment. Uh, yes, there are uh, amendments that have been written that are not, uh, that have not been good, and those are two of them uh, and a few others, but there are some amendments that have been good and that have been good for the country. Every amendment that, that has been proposed has been done by the Congress. Let me ask the question. What if James Madison walked into the room today? What would he say? He would probably say, you have all this debt, you have all this dysfunction going on in Washington, D.C. Why is it you didn't use the tool that we gave you? We, the people, know that that is the tool that through you, your responsibility to help us get our government back. This is, this is what we're asking you to do. It's legal, it's not a constitutional convention, it is a convention proposing amendments. There's only uh, three elements, physical restraint, uh, power and jurisdiction in the federal government, and term limits. And that's the only, only issues that can be discussed. Any other areas would be not germane to this, uh, to, to this amendment. <clears throat> you, our state representatives, are the key to solving our problem in D.C. So we're asking for your help. Please support the Article 5 Convention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cabbage. Representative Thorpe. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, would you agree with this statement? You know, our, our Constitution starts off with we the people. The con would you agree with the statement that the Constitution is a contract between the states and the people within those states and that the product of that contract is the federal government. I do agree. And, and so, so that product is broken. And, and it's up to the people that initiated that contract, uh, the people of the United States, to actually bring it back into uh, uh, a proper context, what our, what our founders had, had hoped for. Um, you know, we heard a, a comment earlier that, uh, you know, that is a very easy solution to this problem is to turn the spenders out of office. Uh, how has that worked out, in your opinion? We, we've been trying to vote the right <coughs> folks in. Uh, my guy's better than your guy uh, for a lot of years. Uh, again, I think if you, if you look at what's happened since the early 20th century, we have developed two constitutions, one that's interpreted by the Supreme Court by nine people, typically judged by a single person, the Chief Justice, and not not what was uh, what not what had occurred in the previous 150 years. So, the uh, the, the argument is well, uh, how, how are they going to not? Uh, we are following the Constitution the way that the uh, Supreme Court has has uh, has interpreted it. We are not following the one that the founders. Gave us. Madam Chair, just one other follow-up, um, and and I don't want to um, you know uh, disparage our, our senior senator, but uh, four years ago, uh, when Senator McCain was challenged uh, by Mr. Hayworth, uh, Mr. Hayworth was able to raise one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars in the pro for the primary, and Senator McCain spent twenty million dollars in defeating Mr. Hayworth. So. The easy, as, as was referred to e earlier, the easy way of turning these you know, people out of, out of their elected office, uh, it's not terribly easy, is it? No, it isn't. It's not, it's not easy at all. Um, term limits, uh, the original intent was that uh, 
the founders felt that the, 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 the folks would be uh, serve their country and then go home. And that's what we have to get back to. Okay. Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Members, any other questions? Okay, Mr. Vice Chair, call the next person. The next speaker who will speak against the bill is Mr. Bill Bluster. And, sir, you're speaking for yourself, and you have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I rise in opposition to this resolution. And, Madam Chair, I want to point out something that I saw yesterday on the Internet, and that is that Arizona is the tenth highest state in receiving federal funds as part of the budget. It's the total spending for Arizona. We're the tenth highest. I understand there's a bill in the hopper to take care of that problem and uh, put it through, have those funds that come from the federal government go through the legislature, which is, we're, I think there are only three states that don't require that. And so that's for another matter, but we need to take care of that. <clears throat> Proponents of an Article 5 convention constantly refer to the need to rein in our, quote, out of control government. What we're actually facing is an out of compliance with the Constitution government. Therefore, the Constitution is not the problem. So changing the Constitution with an Article 5 convention is not the solution. I'd like, I haven't heard a cogent reason yet how, or a cogent example of how you're going to force Congress to comply with any amendment to the Constitution when they're not complying with the Constitution the way it is now. An Article 5 convention would consolidate the inherent powers of a free people, as Representative Thorpe talked about, whose right, quote, to alter or abolish our government is described in the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, quote, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Based on this right, as proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence, coupled with the president, precedent of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, and that's what they call it, an Article V Convention would therefore be empowered to rewrite or severely alter the Constitution without any limit on its action. Proponents of an Article V Convention assure us that delegates appointed by state legislatures can propose amendments, the amendments can be ratified by the states, and the resulting amendments will miraculously rein in our, quote, out-of-control federal government. This starry-eyed scenario is a major fairy tale. A Rasmussen poll of 1,000 likely voters conducted April 15th and 16th of last year found that 67 percent, quote, view the federal government today as a special interest group that looks out primarily for its own interests, end quote. What this poll result indicates is that about two-thirds of likely voters believe that special interests now control our federal government, which is to say that it is a fairly widely shared belief that our government is controlled by powerful special interest groups, such as big business, big labor, big news media, the education establishment, etc. It is these special interest groups that over the last century or so have influenced public officials to usurp powers not granted in the Constitution. Who's to say that delegates to an Article V convention would not be so influenced? This particular resolution is really vague. What specific amendments are its proponents putting forth? I haven't seen one specific amendment. It talks in generalities, but no specifics. Are you willing to leave that up to the delegates I just described, those that are heavily influenced by big government, big, I mean, by big labor, big business, big news media, and so forth? Madam Chairman and members, in Article 5 Convention, or whatever those promoting it want to call it, is fraught with danger. The Constitution is <coughs> Let's not tinker with it. Bring the government back into compliance with the Constitution and save this great republic. Please vote no on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blister. Members, Representative Thorpe. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, 
I was looking through our, our Bill of Rights and I was thinking, you know, can we get an example of the federal government violating the First Amendment and um, anytime they try to, they get slapped down or, or we saw it recently in Texas that a, um, a mayor tried to violate the First Amendment and they got slapped down pretty quickly. Um, what it, what it uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I, haven't, yes. I haven't posed a question yet. Right, um, thank you. The, um, so I, I, I continue down through the list of our Bill of Rights. And by the way, our founders, uh, three states in particular, refused to ratify the, the, um, our Constitution unless there is a uh, Bill of Rights, uh, a guarantee of a Bill of Rights. But I get down to number 10 of our Bill of Rights, and it says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited to it to the states or reserved to the states respectfully or to the people. And I think that there are members of this committee that uh, feel that um, the people have not been represented by our state legislatures and the legislatures have not represented their duty to uphold the Constitution, uh, that we've sat in the corner quietly as we've seen usurp uh, our constitution usurped by the federal government what we're doing today is we are trying to uphold the 10th amendment we are trying to once again tell the federal con uh, federal government and congress that we have a contract among the people and among the states they are a product of that contract and that contract is currently broken and they're violating terms of that contract. So today, I certainly am standing up. Uh, recently, Chief Justice Ro uh, Roberts said to the states, if you're going to be considered sovereign, you better act like it. Sir, I am trying to act like a sovereign today. And in everything I do down here at the legislature, I recognize the role of federalism, that the states have a, a voice in federalism. I do not believe in blanket supremacy from the federal government. It, sa it states that any law that Congress passes must be in pursuance of the Constitution. And there's many things that the, con uh, that the Congress passes or is delegated to the EPA that are not in pursuance of the Constitution. And the problem has been that the states have not stood up and, scr and screamed bloody murder from the rooftops. Well, today, <laughs> This committee and members of this committee are, are standing on the rooftop screaming bloody murder and telling the federal government that we're coming back to uh, regain the proper balance of federalism. Thank you, Mr. Thorpe. Members, any other questions for Mr. Booster? Thank you, Mr. Booster. Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Madam Chairman, our next speaker uh, will be speaking against the bill. It's Mr. James Pinkerman, and he represents himself. And Mr. Pinkerman, you have five minutes, sir. Well, we'll make that five and a half minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll read this so that I get my thoughts. I've worked and worked on my thoughts, so this isn't somebody else I'm reading. It's myself. I'm Jim Pinkerman, and I'm... Uh, for the Constitution, but feel that this is right now not the smartest thing to do. So you might say I'm against the bill. And uh, I think America is in worse, a worse predicament than we may suppose. Even if an Article 5 convention could be limited, which most real constitutional scholars agree, as does Mr. Robert Natelson, or Natelson, I'm sorry, of the Goldwater Institutes, there is still a great risk that it cannot be limited. Our very real problem is that the states are complicit in accepting national programs and mandates and the grants and funds that attach to those programs without any constitutional authority to do so. And when we say runaway national government, we should include state legislators, governors, and citizens who have given in to and even encourage unconstitutional spending over many decades. Many of these people are called conservatives. <laughs> yes, we are in worse trouble than perhaps we think when we've failed on getting our fellow public servants to reverse these programs 
to refuse the funds and give and get back to legitimate constitutional functions only. We in Arizona have recently seen this failure. And also, we have a budget, reportedly about 38% national funding. And uh, Arizona, as reported, is, a, is about 10th from the top in getting money from the federal government. We're in worse trouble than any amendment can remedy. We need to act courageously, electing those who will move closer to the Constitution instead of applying to Congress, which America's eager left wing is also promoting, and I have something on that which I'll present, um, to call a convention to throw more amendments at a Constitution that we're not following. And the suggested balanced budget amendments do not deal with the real reason for our predicament. I've read these balanced budget amendments, and they work within the, the fraudulent system rather than try to correct it. And the, the real reasons which are that we are disregarding the enumerated powers of government, helping promote most or costly entanglements in foreign conflicts, and preserving our debt-based, unbacked, inflating paper money system. In fact, maybe the balanced budget amendment would better be called the authorized debt amendment, mm -hmm. since it would codify keeping America well within this whole debt-based system, which is the danger in the amendment in codifying. Is it a long way forward using our God-given power of ending unconstitutional national government programs? It's only as long and as tiresome as we choose to make it, but we will be traveling toward freedom as we go, and that is a glorious cause for us to be involved in. But will there be bloodshed before we finally awake enough to act effectively? Why are we pushing for amending the Constitution instead of following it? Perhaps many of us were not taught correct constitutional principles in our schooling. Perhaps many do not understand enumerated powers well enough. Explicitly limiting the national government throughout the Constitution, and specifically in Article 1, Section 8, and in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. And perhaps we don't properly understand the American founders' laws of nature and of nature's God, which give us divine power to void bad national law. We have the power to do it. Many powerful left-wing interests are also promoting an amendments convention. They badly want a national convention for their own purposes and are gearing up for it, even to the point of cooperating with conservatives. Our committee has a well-documented flyers, which I tried to pass out earlier, and we have them available for someone who wants, that... Um, about this, about the left also liking further amendments that don't, the left also loves further amendments that don't address enumerated powers, constitutionally unauthorized spending, or a Federal Reserve System paper money system that keeps America constantly deeper in debt. And if you knew how money is created, you know that we go into terrible debt every time a dollar bill is created from the Federal Reserve System. And it doesn't, the balanced budget amendment doesn't say anything about this or the enumerated powers. And I presume that's where we're headed on this uh, uh, application toward a balanced budget amendment. That calls for a question. What are conservatives hoping to conserve? You're called conservatives by trying to amend a constitution that we are not following. Mr. Pinkerman, you have 10 seconds. Please take the high road and vote no on HCR 2003. Thank you. And I'll try to answer questions. Members, are there any questions for Mr. Pinkerman? And incidentally, I'll say one more thing, as if somebody has asked it. <laughs> somebody <laughs> said ratification will help to solve the problem. I read the, uh, the revised statutes about ratification. And uh, in order to get together a ratifying committee among the citizens in Arizona, they have to pre- state their opinion about whether they're going to vote for or against Okay, Mr. Bill. Pinkerman, thank you. In other words, there's no deliberation. Even Mr. Pinkerman, thank you for your testimony. I have a question. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Mitchell. I'm curious. You said uh, that we want to change the, the, those who support Article 5 want to change the Constitution and we shouldn't do that. Aren't some of the amendments that have already changed the Constitution bad? Would you agree that there's a bad amendment that's been passed? Absolutely. So if we removed one of those bad amendments to restore the Constitution, wouldn't that be a good thing? 
Yes, we did that with, I think it was 18, and we removed it with Amendment 21. And through the chair, please. And now, and to that point, it was of 21st. Chair, uh, Mr. Uh, Mitchell, uh, yes, we <coughs> did. Um, 18 was removed by 21. It was on pro prohibition. We can. Okay, Madam Chair, what I'm, what I'm getting at is that we keep hearing from the folks that oppose this that we are somehow not lovers of the Constitution, that we want to change it, we want to open it up to who knows what which really isn't the way this process works. I think we, you and I and, and some of your friends probably agree on a lot of things, and I hate to disagree with you on this, but it seems to be that we both have a, a fundamental, or my opinion is that you have a fundamental misunderstanding of what this process does and how it works. And I'm sure you feel that those of us that support it also have a misunderstanding of how it works. But if we can remove an amendment, that perhaps one of the progressive am amendments that we think is hindering the ability of the federal government to work well or federalism to work as it should, then that would be a good thing. And if we can do it, Mr. Pinkerman, through the chair, Madam and chair. and and Mr. I, Pinkerman, um, Representative Mitchell's not finished speaking, and I'm going to ask you to please observe the the decorum. Otherwise, we'll have to ask you to step. Madam Chair, I'm just going to close by saying that we agree on the 17th Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pinkerman. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, will you please call the next speaker? The next speaker uh, who will be speaking against the bill is Mr. F. Thomas Friedler. And you have five minutes, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. members. Uh, I have uh, placed a, a document with each of you uh, where uh, I have written what I'm going to say and essentially I refer to the Declaration of Independence that says that governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. I'm here to give notice that I do not consent to this amendment, uh, this amendment uh, call. The, uh, in line uh, nine, uh, it says, <coughs> whereas the federal government has ceased to live under a proper interpretation of the Constitution of the United States, It's been argued back and forth here before me that you cannot correct uh, misinterpretation by adding to it. That's, uh, that's what this uh, uh, call uh, is uh, attempting to do. And I don't, I don't consent to it because I, I don't believe the remedy does what it intends to do. I applaud the motive behind the people who are sponsoring this. I share their, uh, <coughs> their concern. But all the ills mentioned in the whereas clauses are ills caused by the federal government acting in excess of the enumer enumerated powers delegated to the federal government by the 13 states. It was those 13 states that created our, our current federal government. And as this committee has, uh, or the sponsors, have, uh, have acknowledged, uh, that is where the authority comes from, and that's where it should still come from. However, since uh, the Civil War and the 14th Amendment, a lot of that has been reversed and now the federal government uh, exercises, I believe unconstitutionally, exercises authority over the states and the states derive its authority, their authority from the federal government. That is contrary to the way it should be. So I get back to the proper remedy, and that's been mentioned before. The proper remedy is for the state 
to achieve constitutional financial independence from the federal government. As I said in my uh, testimony on the previous bill, uh, a, a state that is in debt is not free. A state that is in debt cannot exercise its, its sovereignty. What we need to do is to uh, achieve constitutional financial independence. That will require a courageous, sacrificial, lengthy, del delicate, and deliberate process, which you are doing. I commend you all for doing that. You're doing that now. And I say continue doing that through state legislation. Do not alter the uh, the precarious uh, balance of of the enumerated powers. The problem with uh, making a, a uh, an amendment when the enumerated powers are not the powers that the federal government is limited to is it confuses the issue at Muddy's the Water. He says, oh, here's another Mr. authority we're going to give you. 30 seconds. Okay. I'm finished. <laughs> oh, keep, going. keep going. Let's hear it. That, that was my concluding statement. Oh, statements. shoot. Timing is Why don't you repeat that, sir, the last statement, since I interrupted. Oh, now, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm challenged. Uh, I'll just read what I wrote here. You all got it there uh, in um, archived. Um, the remedy will require a courageous, sacrificial, lengthy, delicate, and deliberate process of freeing the state of Arizona from federal obligation. Means they have to. We we have to stop accepting those federal funds. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Members, any questions for Mr. Feldman? Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Wheeler. Uh, sir, did, did you say you had some documents that you distributed to us? Yes. Uh, I, I don't. Um, to that point, um, I had asked, there, th there was several documents, and I was going to make that announcement that our, our folks in the audience have some items for you. If you're interested, I'd ask you to go to them to pick them up. Uh, Madam Chair, could I request in the future that material be given uh, to us prior to testimony, especially if a citizen takes the time to write something for us to read? I will take that into consideration. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker speaking for the bill is Ms. Kayla Diley. Is Dilly. that? Dilly. Dilly. And she is 17 years old. Please step forward, ma'am. Please mention who she's with. And she is representing herself. And you have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Townsend and the members of the committee. My name is Kayla Dilley, and I chair the National Board for the Convention of States for Teen Organization. We go by the acronym COST because it um, symbol symbolizes the future we face. If we don't reduce the size and power of the federal government, what will it cost us the future generation, the ones who will be receiving the $18 trillion bill. Um, our mission statement is, we, the teenagers of the United States, in order prom to promote a convention of states, provide an awareness of our Constitution, perfect our education as future leaders, preserve our economy through entrepreneurship, protect our future through activation, and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish the Convention of States for Teens. So as you can see, our mission statement starts with a desire to promote a convention of states, but that's only one-fifth of it. The other four parts focus on the Constitution, education, the economy, and being active in government. We know that it is these four other areas that will make a convention of states successful. We're asking that everyone, both those who support a convention of states and those who oppose, uh, help us fulfill our mission. We believe that if we stand united, we will be stronger. Think of the possibility of combining the efforts of all those who believe in the original Constitution and principles that maintain that freedom. We could stop the decline of our nation and preserve a great future. If I was your daughter or granddaughter, 
standing in front of you and you hold my future in your hands, what legacy do you want to leave me? Do you want to be known as the generation who allowed the once greatest nation on earth to fall or the generation who left their children with hope? I believe a convention of states can light the spark of hope and trigger an educational awakening. And I believe that even though the majority may never fully awaken, there are enough good people who care about the United States and its posterity to get the education they need to prevent the continued loss of our freedoms. Remember, only 3% of the population was involved in freeing us from British rule. We can only imagine how hard it is to be in your position to make decisions for the entire state. But like the symbol of the lone man in Tiananmen Square facing down a line of tanks, we refuse to live a life of fear. We will live a life of hope. We have hope in our country. We have hope in its people. I'm just a teenager. I don't have the influence and power that you hold. And it almost feels like I'm standing in front of a long line of tanks. But someone has to take a stand. I want to be that man in Tiananmen Square. I want to stand, I want to save my country, but I need your help. I need everyone's help. Please stand with me, and thank you. Thank you, Kayla. Um, you have produced a lump in my throat. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say before we take questions from the members that I am so thankful that you're standing here. I, I have a, a daughter that turned 18 this morning and I have a 23-year-old, and then I have a 15-year-old, and I and I think of them and and their children, and and your manifestation of what's happened in our country and the debt that you've stood you've stood here. This is historic for you to do this, and I hope I don't look like a tank, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I applaud you for that, and I thank you for having the courage to come here and speak on behalf of your generation and the gener generations that come after you. And it's going to take you and, and your friends and your family and you know, it's your, you are the answer a as we go forward. So I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart. It really has stirred in me. The word you used was hope. So thank you for that and, and stand firm. Representative Thorpe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I truly appreciate you being here. I've been involved in the Article 5 process for about five years, and the reason that I am involved is because of people like you, young, young people, uh, my children at home. Um, and I, it's my hope and desire that maybe someday, uh, if you want to take a, a, a pay decrease, you might consider running for the legislature and become <laughs> part of uh, the process down here. Um, I, if, if I can. I'd just like to read something very, very quickly from Ronald Reagan. Uh, Time for Choosing, 1964. He, um, he stated in, in this wonderful speech, if you haven't had a chance to read the speech, I highly recommend that you do. He says, for our children, this, the last best hope of man on earth. Then he, he cautioned us and says, or will we sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness? Um, George Bush was irresponsible in adding four trillion dollars of debt in, in eight years. Our current president has doubled that in less time in six years. Eight, eight trillion dollars of debt. Um, it is hard to imagine. I mean, it, it, we're getting to a point where there's not enough money in the world to satisfy uh, uh, servicing the debt that America is racking up. I've, I've, I've enjoyed, or I've, I've used the example before with borrowing $8 trillion, we should all be driving gold-plated rocket cars right now. Uh, where did the money go? Um, you know, uh, and, I, and I hope someday somebody courageous will hold people's feet to the fire and ask that question, where did that money go? But we have an obligation to you <coughs> and to future generations to turn this around, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for being here today, appreciate it. And don't be a stranger, you know, come back, visit us, actually come back and a couple things you can do, you can shadow us and, and spend the day with us and go to, all, and basically you're just chasing us around the legislature and see everything we do, and uh, I hope that will 
you know, if you ever choose to do that, I hope that will inspire you to maybe get involved in a, in a greater way. And thank you again for being here. Thank you. <coughs> Representative Fincham. M Madam Chair and, and young lady, who's your teacher? My mom. God bless you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I mean it. Um, it is. The, the issue is not whether we agree or disagree. The issue is do we participate? And I would, I would, I think I can get Mr. Pinkerman and, and, um, and the other folks who, who might not see things the way we do. They will agree on one thing, I believe. The reason we're where we're at today is the failure of people to participate. We are a constitutional republic. While we may have a democratic participation mechanism, we are a constitutional republic. And in order for that particular form of government to work, we have to have a whole lot of people like you and like your mom. My hat is off to you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative Wheeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I want to commend you, too. I, one thing, though, that I'd like to, um, you know, this is what I'm talking about, vigorous debate. It is so healthy. It's what makes us great. And you said that you don't hold as much influence and power as we do. You hold more. And don't forget that. And, and Representative Thorpe, let's have her bypass the legislature and just run for governor when she's ready. <laughs> Thank you. Did you have anything that you'd like to add? No. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I agree, too. I, was, I had meant to say that as well. Thank you, Representative Wheeler, for, for bringing that up, because you absolutely have power, and especially as you turn 18 and register to vote. Um, use that the power of your being a constituent. Um, use that. And, and thank you for coming. Appreciate thank you it. for having me. Madam Chair, our last speaker who will be speaking for the bill is uh, Mr. Dustin Romney, who speaks for himself. And, sir, you have five minutes. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. I respectfully submit that you should have saved the best for last. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kayla, for that tremendous statement. My name is Dustin Romney. Um, I am a former high school teacher here in the state of Arizona. Over the last few years, my life has changed course dramatically. I had seen the course our country was on, and I made up my mind to do my part to change it. So I left teaching and set out on a new career. I began by putting a tremendous amount of research into what I believe is the solution this country needs. Last year, I published my book titled Rule of Law, Why and How We Must Amend the Constitution. When I began writing this book in late 2012, there weren't many people talking about an Article 5 convention. <clears throat> Since that time, the Convention of States Project, whose resolution now stands before this committee, sprung into existence and expanded rapidly across the country. And I am now the Education Director for the Convention of States Project in the state of Arizona. When I found this organization, I was extremely encouraged that so many were coming to understand what I had, that amending the Constitution to clarify the boundaries of federal power is the most probable way we will ensure the endurance of our liberty and standard of living. A hundred years ago, in the midst of tremendous economic changes spurred by the Industrial Revolution, this nation set out on a novel course. We decided that the national government should provide workers' compensation, a minimum wage, labor laws, and Social Security. We decided that Congress should be able to spend money on whatever it wanted and that it ought to have its own private bank to finance it. Then we decided that government should be able to regulate commerce of every kind, whether or not it was interstate or whether or not it was actual commerce. These decisions were made with virtually no regard for constitutional restraints. Now, for our purposes here, I am willing to set aside the debate over the merits of those individual programs and initiatives. Maybe they were desperately needed at the time. Maybe they're still desperately needed. But this radical shift in the role of our national government at the expense of constitutional law has taken its toll, and we feel the effects today. In 1913, total government spending was 7.5% of GDP. In 2011, it was 41% and is poised to reach 50% within the next 10 to 20 years, 50% of GDP. 
Soon after the progressive era of the early 20th century, the Cold War followed. Then came Medicare and Medicaid. We decided not only that government should play a parental role in our domestic economy, but that it should also play a parental role in world affairs. We decided to radically change the role of government, and that is exactly what happened. And now, quite literally, everyone in the world has their hand out to the United States government. And why should it not oblige? The Federal Reserve provides the cash, the Supreme Court took care of those pesky constitutional concerns, and the politicians that run the national government need the support of each constituency that has its hand out. Whether it's the farm lobby, the defense industry, oil and gas, wind and solar, students, senior citizens, corporations, foreign governments, diseases, the middle class, the poor, the wealthy, and on and on and on. There is no incentive for politicians to stop spending, and there is no incentive for the constituencies that depend on it to stop demanding their share. When aggregate numbers are pointed out, each participant says, it's not my program's fault, go after that other one. And they're all right. When everybody benefits from the problem, nobody wants to make it go away. It is a classic tragedy of the common scenario, each politician benefiting individually from the shared resource of our money. Anyone with a tacit understanding of the budgeting process in Washington knows just how vividly this scenario plays out. Representative X wants a dam in her district, and Representative Y wants a tank factory in his district. If Congress were limited in the amount it could spend, then a choice would have to be made. Since it is not limited, the choice is easy. Do both. Should we really be that surprised when we see federal bills so full of pork? And of course, it isn't just pork that's the problem, but the pattern is the same. Politicians in Washington have no need to compromise or to make disciplined choices. So why would we be surprised that they don't do either? <clears throat> the solution to this scenario is obvious. It is not to vote for different politicians who will stop spending on their voters' wants and somehow miraculously find a way to stay in office. It is to place constitutional limits on Congress's spending power. Of course, that is where you come in. The state legislatures are uniquely positioned by the Constitution to change the way our national government operates. In this nation, we believe in the rule of law. All of us are subject to it for the sake of stability and order. It is clear, however, that Congress and the President are operating outside any meaningful laws other than a few charades of constitutional procedure. 30 seconds. Then I'll have to skip ahead. <coughs> Excuse me. The resulting chaos of uncontrolled spending, regulation, and political bickering is as predictable as the sunrise. It is the civil and criminal law which governs citizens. It is the constitutional law that governs government. If citizens' habits were as out of control and irresponsible as governments, then people would not hesitate to suggest changes to civil and criminal laws. Why then would we not discuss changes to the constitutional law in the face of such political, fiscal, and regulatory madness? I therefore urge you to vote for HCR 2003 and add Arizona to the growing list of states who recognize the need to structurally and legally limit the spending and regulatory powers of the federal <laughs> government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Romney. Representative Thorpe. Um, Madam Chair, and thank you very much for your testimony. Um, the President just came out with his budget, $3.9 trillion. It's a 6 to 8% increase over last year, um, which is just hard to believe. Um, the um, Crominus bill that was passed at the end of, of last year uh, didn't give the uh, incoming freshmen the opportunity to vote on it. It was full of pork. And uh, the one that really got me is most, so many of the states are, are under the thumb, under the, actually in the, in the trigger sites or the, the gun sites of, of the EPA, it actually increased the, the amount of EPA spending more than what the president had requested. Um, we, we certainly, um, some might argue that even though we're supposed to be a, a representative, Constitutional Republic, uh, we're certainly not being represented very well when uh, we have these abuses of, of uh, the fiduciary duty that's been assigned to our members of Congress. Thank you. Okay, and members, please stand by. Will anybody in the meantime have a question for Mr. Romney? Okay, stand by. Okay. 
We have a request to speak from the floor. So if anyone else, is, uh, Mr. Romney, there's no other questions? Thank you. Thank you for coming and speaking. And you can fill that out after you've spoken so we can move the process along. <coughs> please come forward, sir. Madam Chair. Sir, please come forward and uh, come to the podium. Uh, give us your name and who you're speaking for, and we'll give you five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate the, I was delayed getting here, so I didn't get on the agenda. My name is Joseph Hobbs. I'm Maricopa County Republican Committee member at large. I've been asked to come here to speak for my constituency and also for myself. Um, I am uh, speaking for um, this action. Uh, we're, I think we're basically all on the same side here. And um, uh, we find ourselves in uh, extraordinary circumstances these days. And uh, our backs are against the wall. Um, um, like you, uh, I believe in the greatness of America. And I believe in the greatness of, uh, in the miracle of our Constitution. It was truly inspired by God. And our Constitution truly gives us the tools that we need to deal with this issue. Uh, unfortunately, we seem to be a few patriots short of a republic inside the Beltway right now. Uh, a few patriots short of uh, the bravery required to act right now to deal with this issue. A few patriots short of the action that needs to be taken to deal with this issue that's in front of all of us right now. And if we could have those few patriots step forward and deal with this, we wouldn't need to deal with this issue on ourselves. The states are faced with the issue. Uh, of but Mr. Hobbs, one moment. A point of order. I don't think he should be addressing or chastising the audience, but rather um, speaking to the committee. Okay, so Mr. Hobbs, as a speaker at the podium, you just you're going to be addressing us and keeping your comments I'm limited sorry. to the bill. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to recognize my friends and the audience on on both sides of this issue. And uh, if you could please give me about a 30 minute notification of the end of my five minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I. Uh, uh, during the last campaign, I ran for Senate in LD19, so I, um, I'm uh, a little bit passionate about these issues. Um, the states have to deal with balancing the budget, and here we have the runaway uh, federal government issuing unfunded mandate after unfunded mandate, and it's truly on a runaway uh, basis right now. And uh, the states have no, uh, no recourse but to find themselves in a position now to react. Uh, to, uh, to these issues that are confronting us. And if we can't get our legislators to act, uh, we're faced with the, with the issue of uh, doing it ourselves. And um, so if this action does nothing more than continue on and putting our legislators uh, on, on notice that um, if you're not brave enough to stand up uh, for us and deal with uh, the, the, the issues as you are, as you've taken an oath to deal with it uh, based on uh, the constitutional grounds that are given to you. If you're not brave enough to act, then we're gonna have to act on ourselves. Uh, do not allow any more of these unfunded mandates to come to us so, so that we have to deal with them in our budget and force us to be so uncomfortable on an ongoing basis. Um, um, you know, we're going to act ourselves and, and put the discomfort back on you and take the issues into our own hands. Time and time again, we're, we're, we're faced with the border crisis, with the illegal immigration, with, um, uh, with uh, uh, unfunded mandate after unfunded mandate, where we're, we're the only country in the world that allows for birthright, uh, where, where we're, we're, allowing, we're allowing birthright um, uh, um, uh, issues to come into our country and have uh, um, citizenship uh, allowed where uh, it, it's a federal uh, birthright that is funded by the states where the, where the uh, uh, birthright certificate is issued. It's, it's got to stop. 
the the uh, immigration is is mandated by the federal government, but it is funded by the uh, by the border states. It's got to stop. So I'm I'm speaking in favor of this uh, uh, of this two zero three action, and we've got to get. Um, uh, we've got to get the attention of our legislators and help them find, uh, uh, find the bravery that's needed to stand up and take advantage of our Constitution that has given them the right and uh, remind them that it's a failure to act on their part that's forcing us to do this. And we're seconds. brave enough to take the action, and we've got to give them the backbone to carry forward. And maybe they'll, maybe during the course of this action, putting them on notice, maybe they'll suddenly take a deep breath and say, wow, we need to do this ourselves. We've got the right. The, con the founders gave us this right in the Constitution. And by, by golly, um, you know, these people are brave enough to do it in Arizona, and uh, why can't we do this ourselves? Thank you very right. much, and uh, uh, I thank you very much for recognizing me, and I'm proud to be here today representing my constituents in Maricopa County as member at large. I'm serving my third term, and I'm proud that they've asked me to be here, and I'm proud to be able to speak for them. Thank you. Thank Mr. you very Jones. much. Uh, members, are there any questions? If you have any questions, I have severe hearing loss and I'm being treated by the Veterans Administration, no, but it's taking forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, members, any questions for Mr. Hobbs? Thank you for speaking up. Uh, yes. Okay, so I just had one question. Uh, and did I hear you mention a resolution in that you said you were a member at large? Was there, did you mention that as far as the resolution uh, that happened? no resolutions in, in the Maricopa County uh, uh, MCRC. At oh, okay, so that was at the state level. That there was a Just you're representing my constituency okay all right so it, mr. vice chair is that our last speaker thank you very much for thank you mr. Hobbs <clears throat> mr. Hobbs is, a, is the last speaker and uh, we have a total of uh, of citizens who have signed up either to speak or to not speak we had 19 against the bill and I'm sorry, nine against the bill and 19 for the bill. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. All right, members, any further discussion before we call the roll? <coughs> no? Okay, good. All right, Madam Secretary. Mr. Fincham. Aye. Mr. Mitchell. May I explain my vote? Please proceed. Madam Chair. Uh, I'm just struck by the fact that most of the people in the room are on the same page. I mean, we, I think we're all patriots and, and we believe in the Constitution. And, and some of us may believe that this is a tool that the Constitution gives us and that the system's broken right now. So why wouldn't we use this tool to fix, to fix what's broken? And that's where I come down on this. I don't think it's a, a lack of patriotism. I think we have a genuine misunderstanding of what we propose or an unwillingness to, to accept it. But I think 99% of the time, I'm, I know that we agree, but on this one, we just don't, and it's a big deal. I know it's important, very big deal. And, uh, but clearly, the Constitution gives us this ability. Uh, I think the, the things are so bad now that why would we not choose to utilize this tool now? Uh, I, I have supported it for some time, and I will continue to, and I vote aye. Thank you, Madam Chairman, briefly explaining my vote. Um, um, yes, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I guess in the words of uh, former Representative Bluster, nothing is wrong with our Constitution. I think what we need to do, and my concern is that if we move to a constitutional convention, there are going to be folks attending that that are not, as, not going to be as accountable as the Congress that we elect. At the end of the day, Congress has the authority to amend the Constitution. If we don't like who we've sent to Congress, then the voters need to change that. Um, and with that, I vote no. Madam Chair, may I explain my vote? Yes, you may proceed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thomas Jefferson lamented that he said that if, if there's one additional amendment or change to the Constitution, it would have been to restrict Congress's ability to borrow money. And in the last hundred years, we've uh, seen you know, money is power. And, and even those that we send to... Uh, Washington who are uh, who call themselves conservative and even fiscally conservative have uh, let us down um, 
James uh, uh, Mason or George Mason, excuse me, uh, passionately argued that the states need the ability to real, you know, to reel in an out of control central government. The people who are in this room, uh, I, who are against this idea, uh, I know that they love the Constitution, and I appreciate that. I personally feel that they're wrong about this issue. With the right hand, they say, I love the Constitution. It's a great document. The left hand, they say, oh, but there's a part of the Constitution I don't love, and I don't want you to use it. So I guess my question to them is, what other parts of the Constitution should we also ignore? This was a, a power entrusted to the uh, government that's closest to the people. It's very difficult for a citizen to uh, have a conversation with their senator or their congressman in Washington, D.C., but they can come in, sit across my desk, and give me help. And they do on all kinds of topics. And I listen to them. And, I, and at the end of the week, when I drive back to Flagstaff, I am, uh, I go to the grocery store, and if somebody sees me, recognizes me, and has an issue with something I've done, I will stand there and look at my eye, and they'll tell me what they think of me. <coughs> and so it's my duty as a state legislator to do everything I can to ensure that the central government is exercising the powers that have been given to them, which are limited and enumerated. And past legislatures have not screamed bloody murder when, when the federal government has done things that they're not supposed to. I intend to do everything in my power uh, to challenge the federal government and to hold them accountable to the limited enumerated powers that they've been given. And with that, Madam Chair, I vote aye. No. Madam Chair, may I explain my vote, please? Yes, you may. Thank you. As Hamlet bemoaned, aye, there is the rub. <laughs> Any new constitutional convention called as allowed by Article 5 would surely attract and include divergent political views, whether they be civil libertarians or extremists of the right, with motives and goals diametrically different from each other. Trust me, I'm not opposed to a vigorous debate. That is part of the fabric that holds us together as a great nation. But this bill, in my humble opinion, is not a serious attempt to hold a vigorous debate expanding universal human and personal liberties. And for that, I vote no. Mr. Campbell. Madam Chair, can I make a comment or two? Please. I live up in Prescott, and I have a beautiful old Victorian home I own. And the home's over 130 years old. And it has a lot of rattles in it. The windows rattle. They're all original. It's uh, not very airtight. The cold air comes in. It gets dusty easy. Um, you know, it needs repair. But it's still a beautiful house. And I'm, pr I'm very uh, proud to live in it. And so that's how I view our Constitution. And, in, and it needs a spring cleaning, just like my house does. And, and I'm not afraid of the people taking this cleaning chore into their hands. I mean, after all, we have the pathway to do it. We're authorized to do it if we so choose. And I don't fear the people of this country making the right choices. Does anyone in this room actually believe the federal government will get its prolific spending under control? I doubt it. Does anyone believe that the uh, self-serving Congress people that we have will voluntarily leave office I doubt that we need a mechanism to make changes and for that reason I vote aye Ms. Townsend. by way of explaining my vote uh, there was uh, uh, one of the explanations of votes was mentioned that at the end of the day Congress has the power to amend the Constitution and I find that uh, profound um, and, and very, um, it, it, it illustrates our attitude towards the federal government, that the idea that at the end of the day, it's, it's Congress. At the end of the day, it's the federal government. At the end of the day, they're in charge. And I want to remind us about how you boil a frog. <laughs> you put that frog in cold water. 
If you put the frog in hot water, he'd jump out and say, I'm out of here. But you put the frog in the cold water and slowly heat the water up, and eventually the frog becomes used to the heat and, and ultimately meets his death by boiling um, because he didn't notice the water getting hotter and hotter. And I'd look at our country much the same. We haven't noticed that the federal government's uh, usurpation of this constitution and the power grab and the, in, and the so-called supremacy over everything is heating up, heating up, heating up until the, the constitutional republic of this country is dead. And at some point, some of us are going to have to wake up and realize, wait a minute, we don't have the freedoms that we used to have. Wait a minute. They're not following the sovereignty of these states. They're not acknowledging the sovereignty of the states. The sovereignty of the family, the sovereignty of the person is no longer acknowledged. And all we acknowledge now and accept is the sovereignty of the federal government. The water's boiling, folks. And that Constitution tells us that, yes, Congress has the power to propose an amendment, but that equal power listed in the same sentence is that the states also have the power to propose an amendment to polish this good constitution of the United States. That time is now. Jump out of the pot or boil. I stand here to say that I'm, I'm ready to, to get out of this mindset and to remind my children and to remind each other that no, it is not all supreme to come in and, and steamroll over what this country used to be. I stand here in support, and of course, I sponsored this bill I am in support of, and the other methods as well, to say it's time to jump out and to reclaim our sovereignty, to give the power back to the people, and for that reason, I vote aye. And by five ayes and three nays, we have passed HCR 2003. Madam, Madam Chair. <laughs> Representative Thorpe. Madam Chair, can you share with me your uh, frog recipe when you have an opportunity? Absolutely. <laughs> and with that, our meeting is adjourned.